Welcome to this Oracle Database World On Demand session. I'm Mark Scardina, Director of Product Management for the Oracle Autonomous Health Framework. And today I have with me Sandesh Rao, who leads the team developing the key AI ops functionality for the Oracle Cloud. And we're going to discuss this essential tech and its architecture, machine learning, and actual operational use in the session today. Before we get started, Sandesh, can you give us a brief background on your time at Oracle to this point? Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me out here. Uh, I've been at Oracle for almost 20 plus years. I've worked on all sorts of technologies from database to application clusters, high availability. And to my current role that I'm actually managing the AI of stack is actually responsible for some of the autonomous database offerings. What is Oracle's view of AI ops? So there's a lot of cool stuff happening in the AI ops space. So the first thing is we automate stuff that customers don't see in the back end so that they can actually use our autonomous database offerings. And we do all the hard work lifting of whether it is uh, whether it is looking at stuff, whether it is automating and finding anomalies. So what we do is we classify AI ops into three different areas. It's observing things, it's automating things, and then it's engaging based on what we have observed. So the observation areas are classified into, you know, looking at logs for incidents, looking at diagnostic collections, writing scripts to automate and parse out uh, specific patterns in the logs that they're interested in. Uh, looking at historical data for performance, how is the system performing? How is this workload? Is this placement policy accurate or not? And then looking at capacity issues, you know, within disk groups, within pods, uh, where, where should we move uh, customers based on our current capacity? And then what we do is we move into the automation phase where we are constantly running health checks. Uh, we perform anomaly detection. We look for root cause analysis of issues. And we have uh, standard operating procedures using run books, you know, where we kind of decide what actions to take corresponding to the various incidents that we see. And the last part, which is, you know, still an extremely important part of this, this tripod, if I may, uh, which is where we engage, where we have, uh, we have automated notifications that come out of the system. We can file, uh, you know, service requests or defects that developers can actually take a look at. So, and most of the stuff is automated. There's no human involved in any of this. We have Slack channels where you know the systems constantly post any asserts that happens to our ops people can log on and do proactive things. As well as we have sanitization capabilities where we can scrub out any important data from our logs that may contain any PII that might identify our customers. So we can look at data, but without looking at any customer personal identification data. So this is kind of like the three different legs of the tripod, if you may. Uh, in the way we actually do our AI ops software. Can you provide a, a an overview of the actual flow of how this all stitches together? So there's there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of uh, different things that happen uh, within the AI ops platform. I try to summarize this at a at a very high level. The first thing is obviously collecting all these metrics, right? So all these systems generate humongous amounts of data, whether it is CPU, memory, disk metrics, and a whole bunch of other stuff, including events that happen. We need to collect all this stuff using something called a telemetry framework. The telemetry framework uh, streamlines these metrics and kind of constructs different kinds of historical overviews on top of these metrics. The second thing is we also have to collect the actual logs that correspond to these issues. Now, what we do is we collect a tiny portion which describes the problem, which we call as uh, mini collections, which can allow us to look at a problem and we know what's happening before we actually have to download all of the data offsite to a processing or analysis engine. So that's the actual log uh, collection along with the telemetry metrics. And once we know or we look at these issues, we can actually create defects uh, automatically for issues that we know are new, something we have not seen before that we like our uh, developers to triage. We have notification capabilities tied in where we can say, hey, if the if the utilization of this pod exceeds like 95% for a certain time, get the ops person involved. So we have the capability to page, email, Slack, people automatically depending on uh, if we trip a certain uh, threshold. And, and a lot of these thresholds are adaptive using machine learning. So we'll discuss this more as we go into the details in the presentation. And then from there, we try to clarify which are the actual issues that need to be looked at. So for example, you can have uh, you know, uh, you can have 20 different asserts that happen inside a database, but, you know, I want you to look at issue number 15, right? How do you tell the user 
or the system that's uh, that's automatically doing this detection as to which issue to look at. So that's called clarification. Once we clarify something, we have the ability to rediscover, where we can see, you know, more than 80 to 85 percent of the issues that we encounter in our cloud are issues that we've already seen. They already have fixes. They already have some kind of an automation running against it. All the operational people already have a standard operating procedure for it. So we want to take out as many of these issues without, uh, you know, humans having to look at it and have automated mitigation in place. So that's the rediscovery piece. And the final piece is if we are looking at new issues, then we can stage all this data in a container that allows us to, you know, allows developers to do their thing and identify what these issues are, as well as we can issue mitigation fixes, apply online patches to our environment. So this is kind of an entire end-to-end -end flow where something goes wrong, we collect the necessary data, we collect the necessary telemetry, we notify the appropriate people, we look for new existing issues, we read all those out, we look for new issues, we stage the data so that the developers can take a look at it, and the next step is to mitigate and fix this across our cloud. Hmm. Well, that seems quite an end-to-end -end comprehensive flow. Looking at it, though, from a machine perspective, how does this platform look implemented within our cloud? So if we, if we dig into the next level of details, right? So we've got different kinds of data that come from these systems. There's alert logs, there's data for compliance, uh, uh, where we, we measure ourselves against a certain set of compliance checks to verify that we're not straying from a, ba a good baseline. Uh, we have health data that identifies what these servers are expected to be based on the uptimes and SLAs that are configured for them. And if they digress from that, then we look at what to do. We have availability data that shows the status of all the resources, their uptimes. We have performance data that shows if we pack a certain number of pods with more than so many number of PDBs, then you know how does it affect our performance? So we have the ability to monitor performance across all these pods and look at if they're violating a good baseline. And the last but not the least is we can actually look at capacity and capacity trending and do we need to add more servers, more storage, and all this proactively without actually letting the user even bothered about most of this stuff. And all of this is captured and stored and scaled out using our object store across various regions. So this is kind of the guts of what the autonomous health framework and some of these things provide as part of the service. I see. So AI apps typically involves machine learning. How is Oracle approaching machine learning for its AI apps implementation? So we use machine learning in very different ways. Uh, in the limited amount of time we have here, I can describe a couple of cases where we try to look at issues. Now, most of the issues, we try to read them out before the issues actually happen. So we have the ability to take data from these issues and construct different kinds of time series metrics on it. So for example, if I'm looking at some kind of a predictive model, I can build a time series I can construct the metric, and then I do some kind of a root cause analysis while simultaneously if I have not, if the situation cannot be predicted, or it's just a it's just a reactive assert, and somebody has to deal with the assert, we can look at the logs and we construct some kind of a precursor event timeline, and then we can automatically do some kind of an anomaly detection and root cause analysis. Both these paths kind of lead to the conclusion, which is mitigating the problem. Uh, either we use machine learning to go through trends and identify something that's diverging away from a trend that we fix the problem before it takes down any system or any portions of the system. Or we look at an assert and say, for example, a database over 600 has occurred. How many people has this affected? Which instances are having it? Is it the same assert that's happening across the fleet? Is there a known fix? And then hence the mitigation here is to roll out an online patch for all those instances before the patch can be rolled out as part of a release update that goes across the fleet. So most of these models across the predictive and the reactive space are constructed using machine learning. So anomaly detection models, uh, you know, Bayesian net models to detect root cause for different kinds of problems are different ways where we use machine learning. The question, well, this looks awful expensive to do in real time. Well, what really happens is uh, we're only training these models in the lab based on most of the data and the use cases that we collect. And a lot of this stuff runs as part of an inference engine, which is pretty lightweight, that runs in near real time on these platforms. So uh, we can identify these issues pretty much as they happen. And uh, we, we use these continuously to train our models back in the lab, which is where the expensive part actually happens. 
I see. So what are some specific areas that make use of this machine, applied machine learning? So there are, there are two examples that I'd like to mention. So the first one talks about how we're doing kind of looking at a real time uh, prognostication, performance prognostication engine, where we look at different kinds of data. We apply uh, Bayesian network filters and pattern recognition engines to see if there's some kind of a problem. And what we try to do is based on the Bayesian net, we have certain uh, cause actions uh, that we can figure out that this might be the root cause of this, or that might be the root cause of this, depending on how we have programmed our Bayesian nets. And this will result in a root cause analysis output saying, say, for example, my machine is slow, it will say, hey, your disks might be slow. You know, it, it, it goes through all the sources of data and tells me what I need to fix. And then there's a alertive action and a corresponding standard operating procedure runbook for this. Now, at the same time, there's the other side of it where we look at logs. Uh, we cleanse these logs, we try to do uh, feature creation, we constantly uh, tune our features so that our models are, are pretty optimal and they can be uh, you know, executed and built and refined a lot more easily. Um, similar issues are clustered together as part of a standard clustering model. Once we generate the model, we kind of take these to our developers and our developers take a look at it and say, hey, is this right? Is this not right for their issues? So it is sort of like a semi-supervised uh, machine learning model. And then once that is done, we have the knowledge base indexed. All this happens in the lab. And then we take this and just run it as part of a, a real-time inference engine on the system, which does all the timestamp correlation and ranking pretty much in near real time and tells you which part of the logs to look at, which, uh, which errors are serious, which ones are affecting an entire system versus the one that's affecting just a single instance and stuff like that. I see. So if, if I'm an operations admin, sort of what is my experience uh, with using this technology proactively to prevent issues as in the first case? So let's, so let's look at this example, right? So there's, there's a couple of things on the screen which shows you uh, there's, we're using a, a cluster health advisor, which is part of the autonomous health framework to monitor and automatically construct an inference or root cause analysis of different kinds of issues. So if you see on the right hand side, you have the char database monitoring, it shows a bunch of issues that are there. The cool thing is, is as a user, you don't really need to look at a whole bunch of data sources to come to this conclusion uh, as to what is causing this problem. You can just look at the char metrics. And when you go to the next uh, slide, you can actually look at the char database monitoring. And there are a bunch of different kinds of problems that are recorded and the areas corresponding to which they are recorded in. So they're looking at things like hangs, they're looking at reader log hangs, they're looking at reconfiguration timings. These are all specific metrics associated with a cluster that may be diverging from a good or a well-known baseline. Now, once you go there, you have the ability to dig in deeper and go into something called the cluster health analyst advisor, which is kind of uh, the output of this tool. And this shows you a timeline across all the machines with different kinds of problems that are happening on each of these machines. Now, for example, say I'm interested in this DB control file IO performance issue, which is one of the anomalies that is actually listed out here. As I go into details, it basically tells me here that these control files are basically not being written fast enough because sometimes we have issues where some of the control files are being written to a certain amount of storage and the storage is slow. So in this case, it's basically telling you that, hey, for whatever reason, the control files are not able to keep up with this. So this is just an example of something I'm doing across the cloud. I, I don't have time to troubleshoot and debug each and every one of these individual issues. So I use this engine to basically go through vast amounts of data and derive some of these inferences for me so that I, I have to physically go change a disk or I have to physically go shift the database to another storage. So that's the only manual action I need to do. But pretty much everything under the covers is taken care of by the framework. Mm -hmm. So what happens though, if I'm not able to detect an issue in advance? So, you know, there, 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 there's actually a huge percentage of issues that get detected in advance, which is the benefit of this platform. But there's always going to be something new that is going to affect the uptime. So, for example, I'm looking at different kinds of exceptions and availability issues as part of the screen out here. And as you can see, I can filter this by availability domain clusters, and I can see the metrics for a certain number of minutes. Now, one of the interesting things is 
I can see there's a certain set of steady collections that have been happening across the server. Now I could just click on those, uh, any of those individual collections and click on the links and it will actually open up all the associated files that correspond to that, co uh, that collection. Now, when I'm clicking on these individual files, it shows me that there's a whole bunch of shared pool memory allocation failures that have been observed. And now, as we know, for a shared pool memory allocation issue, there has to be some kind of a user intervention, right? The shared pool has to be flushed or the SGA has to be increased in size. But uh, here's, a, here's a good example of how we automatically found the exceptions and we catalog these. So I can look for uh, systems that are generating a lot of collections as indicative of some kind of trouble with those environments. So I have the ability to do real-time triage pretty much on these systems without actually physically being on these systems themselves. I see. So what happens though if if I'm not able to deal with this as in at the operations level and I have to hand it off to support? So, so what happens is we've got another comprehensive suite of tools where we can you know, display the anomaly timeline, we can show the events, and we also have the, uh, the ABS or the adaptive bug search results where we go through the uh, various events that have happened and we look for duplicate issues that may be. Now, there's some, some cases where the ABS system automatically identifies duplicates and says, okay, I'm done and I don't need, I don't need any further human confirmation. But there are certain cases where when they are triaging, there may be multiple issues and the system may not know which issue is of interest to you. So in that case, it is necessary to hand this over to support with all the possibilities of what might be the issue. And hence, support is supposed to look at this and get back to the developers as to what needs to be done in this area. You mentioned this ABS. Can you describe mm -hmm. it a bit? So ABS, uh, it's, it stands for Adaptive Bug Search, and it is a piece of technology that we built internally to discover duplicate bugs and any kind of correlated issues over this. Uh, we started building this with data from more than 400 plus Oracle products. Uh, it uses different kinds of technology like logistical regression, triplet loss, where it optimizes its model on the training set to generate accurate duplicate results. We started off with about eight different possibilities for every issue to now we're down to one or three different possibilities at most. And the accuracy of these models are as high as 90%. And, uh, you know, we, we're working with directly with developers and uh, indirectly through bug updates and feedback is significantly improving the accuracy of this thing. So the idea at some point is that we don't need a human to look at this to troubleshoot or diagnose these problems because we should, if there's a known issue and there's a known patch against this issue, it should be automated. That's the idea of using ABS. I, I see. So it sounds like this automation extends into the developer space as well. Yes. So what we what we do is uh, right now we can construct things like timelines. We can filter based on you know different kinds of events and hosts and stuff like that. And we stack these events based on the type of event as well as a timeline of what the event is and this can be looked at by support now once support has determined that this is actually a problem and it needs to be handed over to developers the developers can just execute a command and get access to this in a shell it's called dev shell and what developers can do is they can access this data in a safe secure fashion without actually having to uh, download this stuff in uh, to their to their environments and this allows for extremely fast triage and it also encapsulates all the tools that are necessary for this developer to look at the data and give a quick response. So in other words, take the data to the developers for the analysis so that they can uh, you know, troubleshoot things as quickly as possible in the cases where the automation cannot troubleshoot this. So that thing is called DevShell. And we use this internally you know, pretty heavily to take the test case to the developers so they can give us a response on what needs to be done for this issue. I see. Well, this really appears to be an end-to-end -end solution to bring high availability to the Oracle Cloud. Uh, so what I should take away, and as well as customers from this, appears to be that AIOps has become an, a real essential cloud technology, correct? Yes. So, I mean, you, you really need to understand the problem space first as to what are you, what are you trying to address here, right? And we are trying to make the autonomous database the easiest thing to use 
without developers or uh, users, DBAs having to actually look into most of the backend stuff as to what's happening yeah. and take care of a lot of the stuff for them. It and also appears that, that Oracle is, is looking closely at the environmental, technical, and legal constraints for use of this data to protect the correct. privacy of their customers. That is correct. So we want, we want developers and ops people to be able to figure out issues as quickly as possible without user intervention. So users don't even need to know sometimes these issues are happening and we fix it for them before it happens without actually having to look at any of the user data or even having access to the user's database. Mm -hmm. And it also appears that there are different types of machine learning for the different areas of, of operations, right? Yeah, that's correct. The main, each each use case has a different model and each use case has a different set of training that has to be done with these models. But you have to spend some quality time with your training sets. And mm -hmm. the, the most important thing that we have heard from our users for all these cases is you need explainability. You need better explainability to these training models because a lot of the models work sometimes and you know sometimes like 95% of the time they'll do a good job. Mm -hmm. But 5% of the time they won't. And people want to know uh, what made us come to those conclusions. And that's where explainability into the results is an extremely important part of the feedback mechanism for uh, as part of the model evolution. Mm -hmm. So it looks like that a lot of this is attempted to be automated and therefore we really need to not only actually detect things, but actually do things and perform actions automatically. Yeah. I mean, the whole the whole idea is that you you basically honor the culture and the risk tolerance of your target audience, and this is an iterative journey. You know, you have to continuously iterate to make yourself better. Your users should have an extremely good experience in dealing with the system, and anything that is not within their scope of doing should be taken care of by our ops people. And that's why this is part of the Oracle managed offerings. I mean, mm -hmm. people won't see this but they will see its effects and they will appreciate mm -hmm. the fact that somebody else is doing all this stuff for them, which is something that uh, on-prem people need to do today. Now, one more thing for on-prem people to take away is, you know, you can actually implement some of these pieces that we have implemented as part of our AI ops implementation using the AHF stack on-prem. Yes, and that's our Oracle 21C Autonomous Health Framework, uh, which is able to be deployed not only on 21c but actually on earlier versions of the oracle stack as well and so we invite users to go and check out the autonomous health framework users guide as well as the most current autonomous health framework download off of moss uh, for their own education so th thank you very much sandesh for this informative session and thank you for watching Thank you for having me, Mark. Thank you all.